Uh, and welcome to the section 5.4 video lecture. I'm Dr. Scott Spaniel, uh, your instructor for statistics here with another video lecture uh, for today. So today what we're going to talk about uh, is conditional probability and the general multiplication rules. So you can follow along uh, in the note sheets, uh, which can be found on Blackboard or in my math lab. Uh, on We're going to start today on page 17. So here we go. So conditional probability, um, which can be written like this. This is our notation for conditional probability. P of F given E. So this is the probability of F given E, event F given event E. It's the probability that event F occurs given that event E has already occurred. So the probability of F given E is the probability of F and E occurring divided by the probability of E occurring. Or another way to write that is it's the number of ways that F and E can occur, that they can both happen, divided by the number of ways that E can happen. So what we're doing when we're doing given probability is we're basically restricting down to a certain uh, given characteristic. So one, it's basically make, uh, making the sample space smaller. So for example, um, uh, a little bit more detail. So the probability of event F occurring given the occurrence of event E is found by dividing the probability of E and F by the probability of E, or the probability of event F occurring given the occurrence of event E is found by dividing the number of outcomes of E and F by the number of outcomes of E. So the idea behind this notation is that what we're saying is we're restricting us just down to the outcomes of event E. That's all we're going to worry about. Uh, with the given probability. So for example, one way to look at that is if you know probabilities, like here. So for the month of June in the city of Chicago, 37% of the days are cloudy. Also in the month of June in the city of Chicago, 21% of the days are cloudy and rainy. What is the probability that a randomly selected day in June will be rainy if it is cloudy? So this is the probability of rain given clouds. Okay. And so all we have to do to do that is do the probability of rain and clouds divided by just the probability of clouds. So in this case, that's 21% divided by 37%. And you would expect the probability of it raining, if it's cloudy, to be higher than the probability of it just rainy and cloudy by themselves. And so yeah, what we get is 0.3. zero point five six eight okay so that if it's cloudy out there's a fifty six point eight percent chance of rain in the city of chicago in june okay so that's one way these problems can be presented is given the probabilities we can also be given the raw data so in this case we've got a chart that says uh the marital status of people and their um at level of education in 2006. So the idea here is, what is the probability the randomly selected individual who has never married is a high school graduate? So what's the given here? Well, the given is the thing that we're required to have happen. And the thing we're required to have happen is who has never married. And then we want to know is if they have to be never married, what is the probability that they're a high school graduate? So the probability of high school graduate given that they never married. Okay, and since never married is a given, that means we're going to restrict ourselves to only looking at this row. Okay, so it's a given that they're never married, so we're required to only look at that row because this is going to be the number of high school and never married divided by the number of never married, right, which is all the info that's only in this row that I selected. So the number of high school and never married would be right here, right? Those are high school graduates and they never married. So that's 9,575. And the total number of never married is 31,603. So this is a good example of a problem that's pretty easy to do once you get it set up correctly. So the challenge here with these conditional probabilities is not necessarily the math, but the setup. Right, it's not actually the computation, I should say. It's all math, but 
uh, isn't necessarily the computation. So then the next one says, what is the probability that a randomly selected individual who is, it, who is a high school graduate has never married? So notice how they flip the order here. So what we're saying now is we want the probability of a never married, right? They are a high school graduate, and then we want to know the probability that they never married. So what's the probability that they never married given that they are a high school grad? So the top of our, uh, so in this case, we're restricting ourselves to this column. Right? They have to be a high school grad, so they have to be in this column that I squared um, in green. So this will be the number of the top will stay the same, high school and never married, Okay, because it's just an and between those two, and the way I, order I write them doesn't matter. That's still going to be these 9,575. And then on the bottom, though, in this case, is going to be the number of high school grads, because that's the given, is they have to be a high school grad. So there are 9,575 people who are never married and a high school grad, and there are 60,890 who are high school grads. And so that's 0 0.157. So there is a better chance that someone is a high school grad given that they've never married than there is that they would be um, never married given that they were a high school grad. Okay. So one affects the other one uh, more substantially. Okay, so that's the idea. So why don't you guys flip over to the next page, pause the video for a second, and try the problems on page 14. I mean, 18, sorry. Okay, so now that you've had a chance to try these, let's run through them together. So according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 8.4% of high school dropouts are 16 to 17 years old. In addition, 6.2% of high school dropouts are white 16 to 17 year olds. What is the probability that a randomly selected dropout is white given that he or she is 16 to 17 years old? Okay, so we've got the probability of white given that they're 16 to 17, right? So notice the wording flipped here from the problems we did on the last page because they're telling us which one was given. They're not telling us which one has to be, but they mean the same thing. So it's given that they're 16 to 17. So this is going to be the probability of white and 16 to 17 divided by the probability of just being a 16 to 17 year old dropout. So that's 6.2 divided by 8.4. which is 0 0.738. So if you knew a dropout was white, there's a pretty good chance that they would be 16 to 17 years old. I mean, if you knew a dropout was 16 to 17 years old, there'd be a very good chance, 74%, that they were also white. Okay, so that was similar to the first one we did on the last page, and then these last two are similar to the second one we did. So what is the probability that randomly selected individual who is less than 18 years old has no health insurance? So who is less than 18 years old means they have to be less than 18 years old, which is this column. Okay, and so uh, we want to take the probability of, we want to know what's the probability of no health insur insurance given that they're less than 18. So that's the probability of no health insurance and less than 18 divided by the probability of less than 18. Or in this case, I should have actually put n, so let's fix that. So the number of people who have no insur uh, who are 18, um, less than 18 and have no insurance, which is 8661. And then we're gonna divide that by the total number of people under the age of 18 in this study.
this is 0 0.011. Okay, and then what is the probability that randomly selected individual who has no health insurance is less than uh, 18 years of age? So to do that one, we want to look at the no health insurance, right? They are that. Who is, who has no health insurance? So this will be the probability that they're less than 18 given that they have no health insurance. So the top's going to be the same, the 8661, because that's no health insurance and less than 18, and then the total is 46993. Oh, whoops. And I just noticed on the last one that I screwed it up. I missed something when I was typing it in. So let's go back for a second. This one shouldn't be um, 0 0.11. It should be 0 0.110. And then for this next one, we get 0 0.184. So about 18.4% of people who do not have insurance are less than 18 years of age. Okay. And then we've got one more similar one for uh, down here. So what is the probability that randomly selected traffic fatality who was female was a passenger? So they are female. So we restrict you to that. So the probability of um, passenger given female... So the number of passenger and female is 4,896 divided by the number of females, which is 11,494. So 4,896 divided by 11,494. And notice that's only slightly different than what we would do if I wanted to just know what's the probability of a female passenger, which would be take this 4,896 divided by the total for the whole graph. But because we have a given here, we're restricting what we're allowed to use. So what is the probability the randomly selected passenger fatality was female? So this time they are a passenger. So we're restricting ourselves to the passenger column. And so we're doing the probability that they were female given that they were a passenger. So the probability that they were a passenger is 4896. The probability that they were, I mean, that they are a passenger and female is 4896. The number of people who were just passengers is 10,086. And so that probability is slightly uh, larger, which is 0 0.485. And then the last part um, says... Suppose you are a police officer called to the scene of a traffic accident with a fatality. The dispatcher states that the victim was driving, but the gender is not known. Is the victim more likely to be male or female? So they said that it is a driver, so I'm going to restrict myself only to the driver column. And then I want to find two probabilities, the probability of male given driver and the probability of female given driver. So probability of male given driver is 20,795 out of 27,393, and the probability of female given driver is 6,598 over 27,393. So this first one is 0 0.744. And now because we restricted ourselves to only looking at drivers, there's really only two options, either male or female. So we should expect the second one to be the complement of what we just got. Um, but we can put it in our calculator. And we get 0 0.241. Whoops, one of these I did wrong. Yep, sorry, I screwed up one of them again. I typed in the bottom number for the first one wrong. So this one should be 0 0.759. Okay, so that's the idea of conditional probability. So the idea is you're restricting down what you're allowed to use based on another event, okay, based on a given. Now, what this allows us to do is move on to the general multiplication rule. So the general multiplication rule 
doesn't just apply to independent events like in 5.3. And so the key here is um, the probability of E and F is the probability of E times the probability of F given that E has already occurred. So the idea here is that you're taking into account that E has already occurred when you're doing these problems. So let's look at an example of that. Suppose that a compact disc player uh, you just purchased or an MP3 player or a website you're listening to like Spotify, suppose it has 13 tracks. After listening to the CD, you decide that you like five of the songs. With the random feature on your CD player, each of the 13 songs is played once in a random order. Find the probability that among the first two songs played, you like both of them. Okay? So this would be the probability of two likes out of two. So another way to say that would be the probability of like and like. Okay. And so then the general multiplication rule, um, it, well, let's use some subscript. So you like the first one, given that you like the second one. I mean, like the first one and like the second one. So then the question becomes, uh, if we use the general multiplication rule, it's the probability that you like the first one times the probability that you like the second one, given that you liked the first one. Okay, so the probability that you like the first one, well, there are five songs that you like and 13 songs total, so that means there's five out of 13. And then the second one says, what's the probability that you like the second one, uh, given that you liked the first one? Well, since the songs um, are only played once in a random order, once you've listened to a song that you like, um, how many songs are left still to like? Well, there's only four songs left to like if you already liked one of them. right? We're assuming that we like that one. And there are only 12 songs total left. So that's 0 0.128. Okay. Okay, so then the second one says, what's the probability that you like neither of them? Well, the probability that you like neither of them would be fairly similar to the top one. It would be the probability that you dislike the first one and dislike the second one. So that would be the probability that you dislike the first one times the probability that you dislike the second one given that you dislike the first one. So this first probability is pretty straightforward. If there are five songs you like, then there are eight that you don't like. So eight out of 13 would be the probability that you don't like the first one. Then for the second one, what we're assuming is that you didn't like the first song. And so if they aren't being replayed, how many songs are left that you don't like? Well, if you already listened to one that you don't like, that means there are only seven left that you don't like. And if you already listened to one song, then there are only 12 songs total. And that's 0 0.359. Okay, and then the last one here is the probability that you like exactly one of them. So here's where you have to be slightly careful. Um, because there are actually a couple different ways this could happen, right? Ways you could like exactly one. You could either like the first one and dislike the second one, or you could dislike the first one and like the second one. Right, So there's two different events going on here, and they're separated by the word or, because one of those could happen or the other. So this one's going to be the probability that you like one and dislike the second one, or that you dislike the first one and like the second one. Okay. So then we can use the general multiplication rule, and this is going to be the probability that you like one times the probability that you dislike the second one, given that you liked the first one. The word or is our addition, and then, oh, we're going to use the multiplication rule again. So the probability that you dislike the first one times the probability that you like the second one, given that you disliked the first one. Okay. And we've done some of these before. So the probability that you like the first one is 5 out of 13. The probability that you dislike the second one, given that you like the first one. So if you like the first song, how many songs are left that you dislike? Well, there would be eight left, right? 
because we haven't listened to any songs we don't like yet. And then how many songs total are there left if you've listened to one song? Well, there's only 12. And then over here, fairly similar, if you dislike the first song, that would be 8 out of 13. And then if the, you, what the probability that you like the second one, given that you dislike the first one, well, there are still 5 songs you like left to listen to, but only 12 songs total. Okay, and so for that one, we get 0 0.513. Okay, so that's the idea there. And so that's an example of dependent events, where the if you like the first song, the second song is, the probability of the second song is dependent on whether or not you liked that first one. Because if you like it, then the chances of getting you another like go down. If you... Um, like it, then the probability of another dislike goes up slightly. But these all affect one another. Then at the bottom here, it says, redo the previous three questions if a song can be replayed before all 13 songs have been played. So this is what's called with replacement. So you could re-listen to a song. Well, if you can re-listen to a song, then all that's going to change is the first event doesn't affect it. So for example, I'm not going to do all these. The probability of like one and like two, if they we have replacement, is the probability that you like the first one times the probability that you like the second one, given that you like the first one. Well, the probability that you like the first one is 5 out of 13. And now, if you could listen to that, that song again right away, how many songs are there to choose from that you like? Well, there's still five. And how many songs total are there? There's still 13. Okay, so when you have replacement, you're basically using the um, multiplication rule for independent events. So this is 0 0.148. Okay, so that's the idea of how you can use this uh, general multiplication rule uh, using the conditional events idea. Okay, so why don't you all pause the video for a second and try these problems on page 20, and then when you hit play, we'll go through them together. What is the probability that your first card is a king and the second card is a king if sampling is done without replacement? So you're not putting the card back. So what's the probability that your first card is a king? 4 out of 52. But what's the probability of your second card being a king given that your first card was a king? Well, now it's 3 out of 51. Because if you pull a king out of the deck, you only have three kings left, and you only have 51 cards left in total. So that would be 0 0.0045. Okay, and then what would you do if you could replace it? Well, if you can replace it, then there are 4 out of 52 for the first king. And then if I put that king back in the deck and shuffle, there's still 4 and there's still 52 cards total. So that one's 0 0.059, 0 0.0059. And then last but not least on this page, this past semester I had a small business calculus section. The students in the class were Mike, Netta, Juanita, Christine, Kristen, and Dave. Suppose that I randomly select two people to go to the board and work problems. What is the probability that Dave is the first person chosen to go to the board and Netta is the second? Well, what's the probability for Dave to go to the board first? Well, that's one out of five, right? Because there's five students total. He's one of them, so one out of five. And then for Netta to go to the board, now one person has been selected. So now there's only four people left. So her probability would be one in four. So that's one out of 20 or 0 0.05. Okay, so that's the idea there. Okay. Now, along with this, we can expand this out to do a little bit more challenging of a problem um, and look at something called a tree diagram to help us do these things. So 
the local golf store. Um, Let's uh, we're gonna do. Let's just do one of these together. So let's do this one because it's a little easier to draw. So a bag of thirty-two of bulbs purchased from a nursery has twelve red, ten yellow, and eight purple tulip bulbs. Create a tree diagram to calculate the probability of choosing two balls at random without replacement. So the idea here is you've got your first bulb, and then after that you're gonna have your second one. So what could happen with the first bulb? Well, you could have a red one, you could have a yellow one, or you could have a purple one. What's the probability of that red bulb? Well, it's 12 out of 30. What's the probability of this yellow one? Well, it's 10 out of 30, and for purple, it would be 8 out of 30. And then after you've drawn those out, one bulb out, what could you do with your second one? Well, if you got red, you could get red again, you could get yellow, or you could get purple. If you pulled yellow out first, you could get red, you could get yellow again, or you could get purple. If you draw purple out, you could get red, you could get yellow, or you could get purple. Okay, so the tree diagram starts out by telling us all the possible outcomes. So the possible outcomes here would be red, 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 yellow, red, purple, yellow, red, yellow, 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 purple, purple, red, purple, yellow, and purple, purple. Okay, and now we can use the idea of conditional probability to find the probability of each one of those events. So for example, if I draw a red bulb for the first one, what's my probability of drawing a red one for the second? Well, there's only 11 red ones left, and there's only 29 bulbs total. If I choose red first and then yellow, there's still 10 yellow bulbs left, but the total number has gone down by one. And same kind of idea for purple. There's still eight purple bulbs left out of 29 total. Okay, because all of the ones in the second bulb are going to be have a bottom of 29 because you've already taken one bulb out. So that means there are only 29 left. Okay, so then yellow, red. Well, if you take a yellow one out first, then there's still 12 reds left. If you take a yellow out first, there's only nine yellow um yellows left and if you take a yellow out first there's still eight purples left and then last but not least if you take a purple out first then there are 12 reds left 10 yellows left and only seven purples left and so then the probability for any one of these nine outcomes is simply multiplying the first column probability times the second column probability where they line up so this would be 12 divided by 30 times 11 divided by 29, which is 0 0.152. And we could keep going with that, right? So 12 divided by 30 times 10 divided by 29. So that's 0 0.138. And then we'll do one more. 12 divided by 30 times 8 divided by 29. So that one's 0 0.110. Okay, and so if you wanted to, you could go ahead and calculate the rest of those the exact same way. So you're just multiplying this number times the number here. So the next one would be 10 over 30 times 12 over 29. Okay. So that's how we do conditional probability and some different ways to look at it. One of the things conditional probability can be used for is to decide if two events are independent of each other. If they are, then the probability of an event happening should be the same of the probability of that event happening with a given restriction. So if small random samples are taken from large populations without replacement, it is reasonable to assume independence of events. As a rule of thumb, if the sample size is less than 5% of the population size, we, tend, uh, we treat the events as independent. So the idea here at the top, we're not going to use this for something right now, but we will use it a lot later, is that um, if you take a small sample from a big population, you're not changing the probabilities by enough to worry about independence. So like, for example, if I'm taking 100 Americans out, the probability of the first person being selected is 1 in 300 million. The probability of the second person being selected is 1 in 299,999,999. And as you can probably guess, those are almost the same number. They're very close to one another in value. So with large populations and small samples, 
we don't worry about independence. We just assume they are. In other cases, we may want to know, are they independent? And that's what we're looking at here. So two events are independent. If the occurrence of event E in a prob probability experiment does not affect the probability of event F, we can now express independence using conditional probabilities. Two events E and F are independent if the probability of E given F is equal to the probability of E and the probability of F given E is equal to the probability of F. So in other words, the given part is not affecting the probability value. Okay. So are the events Republican and 30 to 44 independent? So to find out, we just need to know a few things. We need to know the probability of Republican. We need to know the probability of Republican given 30 to 44. We need to know the probability of 30 to 44. And we need to know the probability of 30 to 44 given that they're Republican. Okay, so the probability that they're Republican is 2,200, because that's the total number of Republicans, divided by the total number of people in the study, 4,000. The probability that they're Republican, given that they're 30 to 44, well, in that case, you only look at the column for 30 to 44, so that's 340 out of 724. Then you want to know the probability that they're 30 to 44, so that's 724 out of 4,000. And then last but not least, the probability that they're 30 to 44, given that they're Republican. In this case, we're going to only look at the Republican row. And so we get 340 out of 2200. Okay, and then we just need to see what each one of those probabilities is. So this one's 0 0.55. This one's 0 0.47. This one's 0 0.181. And this last one is 0 0.154. So are any of those equal? No. So therefore, these are not independent. Because being a Republican um, makes it less likely uh, that you are being 30 to 44 makes it less likely that you're a Republican than it is to be a Republican overall. And being a Republican makes it less likely that you're 30 to 44 compared to the probability that you're 30 to 44 overall. Okay. Same idea um, for the next one. Are the events Democrat and 65 plus independent? Well, we can try the same thing, right? I just need to know the probability of Democrat, the probability of Democrat given 65 plus, the probability of 65 plus, and the probability of 65 plus given that they're a Democrat. So the probability of a Democrat, Right, is you just take the total number of Democrats divided by the total number of people in the study, so 1,800 divided by 4,000. Then the probability that you're a Democrat, given that you're 65 plus, you want to only look at this column. And then you take the number of Democrats, 459 divided by 1,020. And then the probability of 65 plus, right, is you take the total number of 65 plus, which is 1020, divided by the total number of people in the study, and then the probability of 65 plus, given that they're a Democrat, you only look at the Democratic row, and so that's 459 out of 1,800. So we get 0 0.45. Zero point four five zero point two five five and zero point two five five. So because these two are equal and these two are equal, these are independent. In this sample, being a Democrat does not affect whether or not you're 65 or older. 
and being 65 or older does not affect being a Democrat. And then last but not least, this brings us back to a couple of terms that uh, we should remember from previous sections, which are mutually exclusive. The difference between mutually exclusive and independent, independent means the events don't affect each other. Um, these mutually exclusive means they don't have any outcomes in common. So are 45 to 29 and 45 to 64 uh, mutually exclusive? The answer to that is yes, because you can't be in both groups. And then this one is no. And you can tell it's no because if you look up at the chart, there are 1,075 people who are Republicans and um, 45 to 64. So those overlap. And mutually exclusive means they do not overlap. Okay, I think that's all we'll do for the video right now. Uh, this is a pretty long video already. Um, so this next one, if you want to try it, is just another example of what we just did. And then these are some problems uh, using what we've done to talk about playing poker, which if you're curious, you can try those out as well. But that's going to be it for today. Join us next time. Join us next time uh, to talk about counting techniques um, in the 5.5 video lecture. And don't forget to do your assignments. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions, uh, you can shoot me a remind message or an email.